Hello and welcome to another episode on Iraqi Nutrition Podcast. Today I have with me Thomas Björnsson, a PhD student from University of Auckland. Thomas, how are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to say that I'm located at the University of Auckland now, but I'm uh, hired at the University of Agder in south of Norway. So I'm from Norway, same as you, as yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. First of all, thank you so much for agreeing to do this uh, interview today. We're going to talk a bit about blood flow restriction training. Uh, before we start, could you give us a short background about yourself and uh, how you got interested in, uh, in exercise? Yeah, of course. Um, my interest for uh, exercise science and stuff started uh, when I was 10 years ago when I started working as a personal trainer, I think. I uh, met a lot of questions that I couldn't answer and went from there to doing my uh, uh, bachelor's degree within sports science and went on doing my master thesis within um, exercise physiology looking at antioxidant supplementation and adaptations to exercise. And then uh, I met a, a researcher called Joran Poulsen which led the studies on antioxidant supplementation started working with uh, their group and uh, went on with my PhD within blood flow restriction re uh, resistant exercise, which we are talking about now. So I've currently done three studies uh, together with the group by, uh, led by Professor Truls Hårsta and uh, a researcher called Matthias Van Boom, which is really knowledgeable within this area. And I've done a lot of research on it. So I've conducted uh, two studies there in uh, Oslo with them and another study in uh, my hometown. So I'm finishing up my analysis in, um, within gene expression, looking at muscle biopsies in Auckland uh, right now. So I'm living in, in New Zealand this first half of 2016. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So let's, um, let's jump into the questions. Uh, could we first? Uh, could you first explain what blood flow restriction training is, and if there is a difference between blood flow restriction training and occlusion training? Yes, of course. Um, so blood flow restriction system exercise often often called, or it's you restrict the blood flow to the muscle. The goal is to occlude the venous return and just restrict some of the blood flow, arterial blood flow. So arterial blood flow is uh, blood flow going into the muscle and venous return is the blood going back again. So when you're doing that, you're uh, accumulating a lot of blood within the muscles. That gives a swelling effect on the muscle and you get a lot of what we call metabolites accumulating within the muscles that we think is important for the effect of BFR training. Um, Occlusion training is a synonym you use, so it's like occlusion training is, is when it's uh, re when you read about it or something in the literature, it's used as the same type type of training. Someone uh, there's a lot of people that thinks you have to occlude all the blood flow when you're doing that, but it's it's used in the same way. And and the main part of all studies, even if they call it occlusion training, doesn't really aim at occluding all of the blood flow. Yeah, so you use a, a wrap or um, a cuff of some kind to restrict some of the blood flow while you're doing exercise. There's even studies looking uh, at just a or restricting some of the blood flow while you're walking, showing muscle growth in from that. I would uh, emphasize that uh, those studies are in untrained individuals. But, and there's different kinds of exercise modality that you have tried. But the main part is done on, on resistant exercise or strength training uh, and low intensity strength training, meaning about 20 to 30% of one repetition maximum or, or the maximum you can, can do in exercises. Okay. Uh, I, yeah, I can say I, the type of training, both frustration, resistant exercise, or occlusion training originated a really long time ago, actually like 50 years ago in Japan, with a researcher called Yoshihaka Sato, 
Yoshiaki Sato. He um, was uh, attending a ceremony, like a Buddhist ceremony, and sitting in a special position where he felt some felt some swelling and and discomfort in his calf, calves while he was sitting that way. And that's actually how he started to experiment with uh, that kind of training and seeing if he could, could have a benefit of it while he was training. So it's been a been around for a really long time, but it's it's just lately, like the ten last ten twenty years, that it's been popular or more spread around the world in different countries. Yeah, yeah. I remember um, when I did my um, personal trainer certification at the Norwegian School of Sports Science. Um, Jöran was talking a lot about it, and this was in two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine, I think. Mm. So. Um, they were um, doing a lot of testing on that during that time, I remember. Mm, that's uh, part of uh, Matthias Van Boom's dissertation. He did his PhD on that yeah. in, in that time frame. So he's, he's yeah, done a lot of within this field and looked at it. And we're trying to build uh, further and, and investigating more of the mechanisms and different uh, protocol, how, we, how you can uh, apply this kind of training as well, based on a lot of his studies after this. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Uh, back to the equipment that you, you use for uh, tra training this way. Uh, you talked about um, cuffs and, uh, and knee wraps. So, is there any requirements for, for, the, for the width of the, of the cuffs that you use? Yeah, so this has been a, a like highly discussed subject within BFR training. What width and, and what kind of equipment you should use. Uh, the, the original uh, cuffs from the, the guy and uh, the researcher in, in Japan, they're actually quite like uh, thinner than, than the, way, the ones we use. So they're approximately three centimeters, uh, uh, the one they use on the arms, and uh, five centimeters uh, on the legs, a little bit uh, thicker there. So the main determinant of how, how much pressure and, and thickness you need is in the circumference of your limb that you're trying to restrict the blood flow in, so how, how big it is. Uh, so you would need a little bit wider on your legs. But so we, the research we do is mainly with a wider cuff on, on your legs. We use a, a cuff that's 15 centimeters wide with a pressure zone of about like 30 and a, and a half centimeters. So that's quite quite much wider than than compared to a lot of other groups and compared to the ones in, in Japan. But they use a higher pressure than, than we use. So you have to see the width of the cuff uh, against the pressure you use. If you use a wider cuff, you can you have to use you should use a lower pressure. If you use a thinner cuff, you need a higher pressure to get the same degree of occlusion or degree of blood flow restriction. So I would recommend to use something in between 5 and, and 15, something that will run there uh, on your legs, and something in between 2 and, and 4 or 5, uh, something like that on, on your arms. Just, yeah, you have to remember that, uh, yeah, the wider cuff you have, the more the less pressure you can use because you yeah, get a higher degree of restriction of blood flow. And how tight, like on a scale from 1 to 10, how tight should it be? Yeah, there's been some suggestions about like 7 uh, out of a scale of 10, or how, how tight you should apply uh, if it's using a knee wrap, so elastic band of some kind. Knee wraps is popularly used uh, on the legs. Uh, I would also emphasize that you, you always apply the cuff proximal part of your limb, so all the way the upper part of your legs or upper part of your arm while you do this kind of exercise. Um, the thing is that we did uh, one of my, my PhD studies uh, with our group was in powerlifters. And powerlifters are really used to applying knee wraps uh, really tight. So if you have someone that are used to a lot of reader, uh, knee wraps or the stronger they are, they will probably, as they did in our study, apply them way too hard and way too tight. So I, I would, to like check how tight it is, I would try to see how many repetitions you can do in the first set. If you are working out uh, 
in any kind of exercise almost within uh, the intensity of 20 to 30 percent of one repetition maximum, I would say that you should be able to do around 30 to 40 repetitions. If you're way uh, out of that range, even like below or over, uh, I would adjust the pressure or if you're not, yeah, if you, it may be that you're not in that range of your one repetition maximum, but as long as you are, I would uh, adjust the pressure to try to fit it somewhat within that range of repetitions. Okay. And, and can you please, uh, could you please explain a bit about what's the standard protocol to use for blood flow restriction training in, in regards to um, how much load you use and how many sets you take and how many repetitions you do? Hmm. So as I mentioned, uh, like a little bit of a point with blood flow restriction resistance exercise is that you can get uh, similar effects comparable to traditional resistance exercise with low loads. So it's the regards to in intensity, it's low loads between 20 to 30 percent of one repetition minimum is like the range that most of the studies have shown a really good effect on. Um, and we can discuss a little bit later on why you want to use low loads only. But yeah, that's the load I, intensity I would recommend. And normally you have around four to five sets uh, that you conduct uh, with BFR. There is one study trying to compare four and eight sets. They didn't show any advantage of doing eight sets. Like they did uh, uh, four uh, sets after each other with 30 seconds rest, then had a, lo a longer break, uh, took off the cuff and stuff, and then um, they did four more sets and they didn't show any, any additional effect. That was the American group by... Lonicky and um, and a a bit therein, yeah. So I would uh, say around four sets. And one of the most normal protocols is to aim for thirty repetitions in the first set, fifteen repetitions in the three following sets, with thirty seconds rest between them. If it's best with thirty seconds rest, or you can use one minute, as several studies have done. I don't really know if there's any, but like one of them that's better than the other one, but some, somewhere in between that. And importantly, you keep the cuff on and the blood flow restriction during all the sets, so you don't take it off in the rest periods. You complete all the four sets or five or whatever you're doing, and then you take it off afterwards. Uh, some of the point with that is we think that it's important to, to accum accumulate these metabolites and stuff, the swelling in the muscle, and it may be that you release them if you release the cuff. So it, there is some studies using, using intermittent blood flow station as well and, and are showing good benefits of it, but I, I would recommend to keep it on during the four sets. Okay, excellent. So, so in regards to blood flow restriction, what has, what has, the, has the research shown? Because I know they've done it on, on different groups. They've done uh, some studies on elderly people could you explain hmm. a bit about that? Yeah. Uh, first of all, it's well established that blood flow restriction resistant exercise uh, gives a comparable effect on like muscle growth and strength compared to traditional exercise or to traditional strength training. Uh, so there's a lot of study, studies showing that with different protocols. Uh, looks like uh, you have like a fatiguing effect of the type 1 fiber. So just to explain that a little bit more, you have type 2 and type 1 fibers in the muscle. You also have different, uh, uh, you can split them up within those as well, but uh, that's the main, main types and type 1 fiber is, has more endurance and type 2 fiber is, is, has more power than uh, the other ones. And you have uh, like a hierarchy of recruiting them. So we start with type one fibers. If you want to lift something really light, you start with using type one fibers. And then when you go up to your max maximal effort, you have to use uh, type two fibers as well. So you want to re recruit and use a broad spectrum of all of these type, uh, all of these fibers when you do strength training, because you want to have a response in all of them. And you, you need to recruit them to have a response in them. And that's a little bit of the, 
the reason why strength training is recommended with high loads, normal strength training. The thing with BFR, it, it seems like you recruit the type 2 fibers as well when you start fatiguing the type 1 uh, fibers earlier. Uh, because you, uh, and some of the reason is because you restrict the blood flow. So, so it seems like you get a, a good effect on, on all of them. And you have a lot of swelling, as I said. Uh, there is a lot of studies showing that. We also reported swelling in our studies and found 25% increase in thickness of uh, wow. one of the quad quadriceps muscle after yeah, just these four sets. So it's enormous swelling. If that is an important mechanism, uh, we haven't really tried, like, looked at if it's the causation of, of the effect, but it definitely happens to a large degree. And there's yeah, a high buildup of, of metabolites associated with this. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons why you can use so low loads and still get like the high the the comparable effects of traditional exercise since you have these these mechanisms kind of act activated. Some of the mechanisms for those who are interested in it is. A lot of the similar ones as the traditional exercise, there is some signaling molecules associated with, the, with muscle growth called mTOR and pathway there. Uh, and there is a study by Gunderman that shows actually they, they try to block that or they block that uh, signaling pathway and they, they don't get the same effect. So they have shown that that's important for it. There's a study from... Um, a group in Lillehammo in Norway that shows like compares the gene expression on traditional exercise, uh, resistant exercise, and uh, blood flow resistant exercise, showing almost the same gene expression as well. So there's a lot of the similar mechanisms that gets activated, but there is something special with blood flow station as well. I would say, and one of the reasons why you can see that is there's one study uh, where they looked at after uh, ACL injury and tried just to restrict blood flow without any contraction, didn't exercise anything at all. They just restricted blood flow intermittently and they showed a reduced atrophy or loss of muscle after the surgery. Uh, and that, that tells us that or indicates that there's something special just with the, the blood flow restriction in, in itself. I don't really know what, what the difference is there, but yeah, there seems to be something. So uh, there's also studies in elderly showing um, a good effect in them. There's a lot of uh, elderly people that has a hard time lifting high loads. Uh, so I, I, would, I would definitely uh, recommend the high loads for elderly because of all the load you get on bone, tendons, and, and stuff like that. But there's, there's people that can't really do it or they don't really they don't enjoy doing it or they, they won't do so much of it so uh, from the studies uh, some of the studies that I've looked at in elderly they actually reported that the elderly subjects really like that kind of type training especially if you don't go all the way to failure as, as a lot of the studies do. They, do they show a good effect even if you go all the way to, to failure uh, another like a uh, big area of blood flow restriction resistance exercise can be during rehabilitation after after injury. Since it's so light loads, uh, you can start much earlier with applying this kind of training uh, after your injury, after your operation, or, or or things like that. So you can use it in between uh, normal or before you start normal strength training. Then, okay, yeah. But how, uh, more into some practical questions, how do you use it, like how do you implement it in your training program? Is it a limitation for how many sets you can do, how many exercises you can do with blood flow restriction during, during a session and during a week? So yeah, so that's, there's some studies looking at really high frequencies if we start with, with how often you can do it. Um, some studies show a really good effect uh, looking at more than 10 sessions on one muscle group per week. But uh, 
a couple of studies that, that we've been, uh, like two of my studies, where we had our participants conducting seven sessions within one week with BFR on the same muscle group, actually indicates that it looks like it can be a little bit too much. And that, that's logical as well. So I think there is a, a border where, at least if you're doing it to failure or close to failure. So, so I, I would pro probably recommend that you can do it uh, up to four or five times a week and, and even more if you do it, if you don't go all the way to failure. But you have to see it and compare it to your, your total training program as well, like strength training program. If you do a lot of strength training, normal strength training, you definitely have to yeah, paradise it and, and look at the total amount of work on, on your muscles. But you, you can do, do this. It doesn't look like it strains the muscle as hard as, as normal training, uh, and you can do it a little bit more often. It, it looks that way, yeah. yeah. But uh, in regards to exercise selection, there's a lot of studies looking at different uh, exercises as well. I think the main part is in isolating exercises as a knee extension um, uh, or biceps curl and, and stuff like that. But there's some studies in, in squat. One of the, the study we did in powerlifters, we used uh, squat exercise. So you can do it in, in exercises that as well. The main effect will be in, in the muscles that is uh, reclu uh, occluded or blood flow restricted, so uh, distal to the cuff. But you also have studies showing a, a benefit to, for example, the chest muscle during a bench press. And uh, I think that that is because you fatigue your triceps, so your chest has to take, take off some of the load and, and help in a, a larger degree. But yeah, so you can use it in almost all kind of exercises. I wouldn't recommend it for deadlift. Uh, for kind of obvious reasons, maybe it would be hard to uh, keep a good form and technique. But other than that, you can use it on, on most kind kind of exercises, I think. And there's been studies in in a lot of a lot of them. I could say something in regards to. I don't really know yet, but there's one study in particular that shows a really high effect on. Uh, something called uh, myonuclides and satellite cells, which is important for muscle growth. Myonuclides um, is, is a nuclei within the cell that has your DNA and, and express your DNA. So there is uh, a lot of studies showing that this is important for muscle growth, um, at least to a degree. So when you're like... Uh, reach a, a certain amount of muscle growth or how, how big it is, it seems like you, you need to have more of myonuclides uh, within the muscle cell. And, and you activate satellite cells to get these new myonuclides. So there's one st a Danish study that shows an enormous increase in, in satellite cells, even compared to traditional like, uh, strength training, uh, after only one week of, of BFR. So and they used the block model, so they had like uh, three times, or they had three weeks with uh, seven sessions within the first week, and then even more actually up to nine sessions within one week. And the thing is that it may be that you can have a benefit on these mechanisms if you include uh, uh, occlusion training or BFR uh, in in like ways of blocks. If you're doing like several sessions within one week and then have a a couple of weeks just with normal uh, strength training, and then you have one week again where you include several sessions up to, for example, five. So that's what we, what we did in our powerlifter is they did uh, five sessions with BFR uh, in their front squats uh, the first week, and then just uh, com uh, had normal strength training, then had the second week with five sessions of BFR and then normal training. So. I don't really know if it's more beneficial to do it in that way in, instead of doing it like just have the last exercise on, on your muscle group within uh, one week or just doing it like one, once, once a week or something. But it may be there's like extra benefit of doing it that way and like have several blocks within a week or something. Yeah.
Okay, great. Uh, that was actually my next question uh, in regards to satellite sales. So I'm so glad that you covered that. But the the power lifter study that you're talking about now, that's unpublished data, or is it published yeah. yet? You no, know, no. Uh, so all of my three studies or our three studies on on BFR now isn't published yet. I've had my three first uh, years of my PhD just doing uh, data collection and completing together with the whole group completing uh, these three studies. Mm -hmm. And I'm here in New Zealand now, uh, finishing off the last kind of like the last muscle cell analysis with gene expression. And after that is yeah. The main. I'm just gonna write up my thesis and write the uh, publish these articles for uh, like hopefully. So uh, all of these studies, uh, including the one in powerlifters, is I hope they're coming out within uh, a year or uh, one and a half year. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. All right, Thomas. That was that was great. Uh, yep. Thank you so much for um, doing this interview on blood flow restriction. Um, <laughs> Are you active on any social media platforms? Yeah, so the best place to uh, follow me or, or find a place where I'm discussing these kind of things is on Twitter. So my Twitter is uh, thomas.bjornsen. Uh, so you, yeah, it's my last name just with a O. That's like the main platform uh, with, on a social media where I just discuss all of these things. Okay, yeah. I'll put a description for your username on Twitter in the in the description below. So, yeah. once again, thank you so much and uh, have a nice day. My pleasure, you too. Okay, thank you. Bye.